Since the invention of the kiss, there have been five kisses that were rated the most passionate, the most pure. This one left them all behind. Welcome to The Internet Says It's True, a show where we learn something new every week, part of the WCBE podcast experience. Uh, I appreciate you being here. I had a great time with Christian Carrion last week talking about game shows. If you're a fan of The Price is Right and you want to hear a crazy story, go back and listen to last week's show. But today's show is going to be a little different. And real quick before we do that, I know a lot of you listen on different platforms and you may not listen on Apple iTunes or Apple Podcasts, whatever it's called, the Purple Icon Podcast Player. But the reviews that people leave there are how we get found. So if you have a free minute today, please go over there, search for this podcast and leave a five star review along with a few words. And that helps other people find us and helps breathe new life into this podcast. That was a segue. Because today's topic is about CPR dummies. Hi, Michael. This is Drew. I don't know if you've heard this, but I found out that the face of most CPR dummies was actually modeled after a dead person from 19th century France. I thought it was a fascinating story and perfect for your show, which I love, by the way. Thanks. Well, thank you, Drew. This is pretty interesting. And I have to say, I really hate the episodes that make me use French words. But this episode will be about L'Inconnu de la Seine. Or here's my... (laughs) I'm so bad at French pronunciations. Here we go. L'Inconnu de la Seine. I hope that's okay. For those of you who are French speakers, tell me how to improve. I don't know how to say these words. Uh, It takes place in Paris in the late 1880s and Norway in the late 1950s, around 1960. And listen, if I botch some French words, please feel free to excoriate me in emails or on Twitter. I can take it. After all, uh, Scott Bayo called me a Karen on Twitter last week and sent hundreds of his Twitter minions after me, I have thick skin. Or in French, oh, a pace. Uh, and yes, I did just translate that in Google on poe pace. Uh, let's start the story. So we're going to go to the 1950s, and the story starts with the polio epidemic. James Otis Elam was a physician and respiratory researcher in the U.S. who discovered the concept of rescue breathing. That is the idea that exhaling into a person's mouth gave them enough oxygen to help keep them alive. He had been working with iron lungs during the polio epidemic, and along with Dr. Peter Safar, helped to develop a new life-saving technique called cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR. This was in the late 1950s, and soon the method of rescue breathing and CPR was being taught as a legitimate life-saving practice. Side note, it should be stated that television and movies have given people a false expectation as to the effectiveness of CPR. There was a study done by the New England Journal of Medicine that showed CPR in TV shows had a 75% success rate, whereas in real life, the success rate is much lower in a person who's not breathing and has no circulation. But with that said, it's effective enough to still be used and taught. And in the absence of medical professionals, It's something that anyone can learn and could help some patients until medical assistance arrives. But how can it be taught? When it was first developed, students practiced on each other. That's right, you had people blowing into the mouth and lungs of people who were breathing normally. And you can still find instructional videos of people doing it this way. After a while, we figured out that this is dangerous, especially the chest compressions that are taught as part of CPR. It creates significant trauma. If you know anyone who has received CPR, you might know that it's common for the ribs or sternum to be bruised or even cracked in the process. This is where we meet the most kissed girl in the world, a fictional woman named Resussi Ann. Dr. Peter Safar knew there was a need for a way to practice CPR without using healthy people as subjects. He expressed this to a Norwegian doctor, Bjorn Lind, who knew of a Norwegian toy maker, Asmund Lerdahl. He approached Lerdahl about creating a lifelike toy, a dummy that could be used to practice mouth-to-mouth breathing and chest compressions. Lerdahl was on the forefront of creating toys with PVC faces, a doll called Lerdahl Ann. And Lerdahl Ann was named Toy of the Year and had become a bestseller in Europe. And this had led him to create realistic-looking dummies with wounds for military training. So he was a natural fit 
to create the CPR dummy that Safar and Lind were talking about. The result was a dummy that, to this day, we know as Resusi Ann. It was unveiled at the 1960 International Symposium on Resuscitation in Norway, and it was instantly so successful that the Lairdal Company was no longer a toy maker. Their new mission would be saving lives. Today, the American Heart Association credits Lairdal products with training half a billion people in CPR and having saved 2.5 million lives. The original Recessian dolls were very simple in design, but today they make full-size mannequins that provide realistic biofeedback and sync data to smartphones as the training takes place. But our episode today focuses on the face of the dummy. It came from a very peculiar place, and I'll tell you all about that after a quick break. When the pandemic hit last year, I took to the internet to present an online show that people could watch every week. And for the next 45 weeks, I presented a one-of-a-kind live stream called Joke Story Trick. Every week, I told jokes, read jokes from viewers, told stories, taught magic, performed my own magic, and brought on a different celebrity guest. We had a sitting U.S. congressman, the first transgender Navy SEAL, professional actors, comedians, scientists, sports writers, YouTubers, and more. And now, you can watch every episode of Joke Story Trick on demand by being a member of my Patreon. And you can join at any level. You can join for as little as a dollar a month. It's patreon.com slash Michael Kent. Or the easy way is just go to jokestorytrick.com. I can't wait to welcome you to the club. Whenever I can, I try to only do business with companies in which I believe. And it's an added bonus if they have the same values that I have, like Scotty Vest. I've been following this company for quite a while. I love their clothing, and they're all about honesty with the customers. I like the brand, their values, and I love the clothing because they have a million pockets. It's all about pockets and well-designed pockets. For instance, they have a pocket for my glasses that has an included lens cloth that's like attached, you know, has, it's on a little cord that comes out of the pocket so you can wipe your glasses and then the inside's microfiber and then on a different pocket, that one is marked in red and that means that it's an RFID pocket so I can put my wallet or my passport in there. I actually just bought a new piece from them this week. It's a sport coat, it's a, like a blazer with, I think it has 19 pockets. I haven't even found all the pockets. That's how good this thing is. There, there are pockets inside of pockets for like, you know, pens and and uh, big pockets. You could put an iPad in this jacket and it won't show the bulk. It won't show the weight, which is great for if you don't want to have a carry on on the plane. If you're just doing a quick trip and you want to throw your iPad in your pocket, it works that way. It's just really well thought out, smart clothing. And you should just go take a look for yourself. ScottyVest.com. S-C-O-T-T-E-V-E-S-T.com. And because you're listening to this show, you're going to get 15% off your order. What you have to do is enter the promo code TELLME, T-E-L-L-M-E, uh, or you can use the link in the show notes. Now let's get back to our story. When Lairdal was developing the Recessi and CPR dummy, they realized that medical professionals were predominantly male at the time and might feel uncomfortable giving mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to a male dummy. They were looking for a female face to use as a model, and it turned out there was already a quite famous one. Now let's jump back in time all the way to the late 1880s. The story of L'Ancanou de la Seine has various roots, but the result of all of them are the same, a plaster casting of a young girl's face. The face has delicately closed eyes and a calm expression. Her mouth has a slight, almost knowing smile with the edges turned up. Her hair is short, parted down the middle. Some claim that the cast was the death mask of a young girl who died of tuberculosis in 1875. Some claim that it wasn't a death mask at all, but it was the face of the daughter of a mask maker in Germany who asked her to model for him. But the predominant story is the legend of the young woman who was pulled out of the River Seine in the late 1880s. An unknown girl was found in the river near the Quai de Louvre, a walking area near the River Seine. She was anonymous. No one knew her identity, her social station, or her cause of death. She had no obvious signs of foul play, so suicide was suspected. The custom at the time was to put bodies on display at the Paris mortuary for people to identify them. There were so many bodies pulled out of the river at that time 
that a special morgue with a public viewing area had been built. That remained open from 1868 until 1909, and in 1889, the public viewing area of the morgue was a more popular tourist attraction than the zoo, the Louvre, and the Eiffel Tower, which had just been built. But despite the crowds, despite days going by, this one particular girl went unclaimed and unidentified. The local population became intrigued by the story of the girl, not only that she was a mystery, but that her facial features were so calm and beautiful. The mortuary had a local mask maker come and make a death mask of the girl. This was another practice that was a custom of the time, when it came mostly to notable figures. But in this case, the local population was intrigued, so her face became known as Lancanou de la Seine, the woman of the sign. It wasn't long before plaster copies of the mysterious woman's death mask started showing up for sale at shops along the river, and then throughout Paris, and before long, it was common to see the mask hanging in any high-class drawing room in Paris. Her face offered mystery, beauty, and Parisians would build their own stories around her origin, where she came from, and how she died. English poet and author Richard Le Gallienne wrote a novella in 1900 based on the face called Worshipper of the Image, in which a poet falls in love with the mask. In 1910, a German author, Rainier Maria Rilke, wrote the following passage in his novel. The caster I visit every day has two masks hanging next to his door. The face of the young one who drowned, which someone copied in the morgue because it was beautiful, because it was still smiling, because its smile was so deceptive, as though it knew. The mask lived on through these works, which still continue to this day, by the way. The mask is referenced in several films and albums of the last decade. So when we jump forward from 1900 to the late 1950s, it makes sense that when Asman Lairdahl was designing his CPR dummy and wanted to use a female face, he would choose this famous and intriguing mask as the face of his recessi and doll. If you look at those early CPR dummies from the 60s, you can definitely see the resemblance. And even today, when you look at Lair Dahl's recessi and doll, they still call it that today, by the way, you can see the face of Lancanou de la Seine. Using the death mask of a drowning victim to create an educational tool may seem morbid until you think about how famous and intriguing this image was and the thought of a young girl without an identity going on to save millions is just one more fantastic story that we have to tell about her. She became the most kissed girl in the world. Sort of a strange and morbid story today, so we're going to lighten it up a little bit. Now, it's time for the part of the podcast where I call a friend, and today I'm calling Dan Wilbur. Dan is a comedian and the author of two humor books, How Not to Read, and Never Flirt with Puppy Killers. His work has been featured on Sirius XM, College Humor, The Onion News Network, and he's been featured in sketches for IFC, MTV, Funny or Die, The Today Show, all kinds of great stuff. Dan recently opened for Patton Oswalt at the Beacon Theater in New York City. Dan Wilbur, good to see you again. Hi, it's great to see you. I'm, I'm happy to be here in my own apartment. You're yeah, here being, uh, now where, where is here? I'm in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. Uh, we just had uh, Maria Dakotas on the show, who's also in Brooklyn. Very funny comedian. Uh, you wrote a few books. You wrote How Not to Read and Never Flirt with Puppy Killers. And when I say yes. never flirt with puppy killers, it is um, a very funny book title. And it's even funnier when you know what that means. Can you briefly describe what that means? Never Flirt with Puppy Killers is a better book title for Of Mice and Men. By John Steinbeck. <laughs> Did you know that John Steinbeck wanted to call of mice and men? This is what he wanted to call it. He wanted to call it something that happened. <laughs> Not a very good title. Not authors are notoriously bad titlers. So I like to go back and, and, you know, market it better for them. So never flirt with puppy killers really is the moral, you know, if he's killing mice, I guess, you know, mm, yeah. what can you do? But that was like an accident and the puppies were an accident. But, you know, don't flirt. Don't flirt with someone who's going to 
it's a kill you. It's a good book. I have a copy of it upstairs, and uh, and I I think I got it from you the very first time I met you, uh, in whatever city that was to make this story interesting. In Albany, no, oh, I, in Buffalo, Buffalo. That may, that sounds right. That sounds right. Buffalo. It was the it was the best thing that ever happened in Buffalo. It was uh, outside of, of was, the amazing speak. wings. <laughs> so uh, today we're playing for this first one. We'll play for posting an embarrassing childhood photo on Instagram. Does that sound good? So if if you get it wrong, you'll have to post an embarrassing childhood photo. Do you have one that you could maybe? I have post? terrible news. I've already posted them all. <laughs> That's well, you'll post one again, I guess. I was Just... a, a twelve pound, eleven ounce baby, and I Ooh. posted that recently, and people are still. Just you roasting know, people you are writing it. to news news companies. And we're like, you got to report on this. <laughs> this is something thing, wrong with this man. This is the thing that happened a few decades ago, but it was yeah. a story that you missed. I didn't open my eyes until I was one. Wait, what? You know, because my because the cheeks were so oh. big. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm that was more some, of a visual <laughs> yeah, visual I'm thinking, joke. Sorry. I'm thinking some medical thing. <laughs> like, oh, I'm so, I'm sorry to hear that. That's horrible. I was medically twelve pounds. Uh, yeah, medically uh, could not see. That's that's amazing. Yeah. Here's your question. The face of the CPR dummy that we commonly see came from which of these unlikely sources? Was it A, patterned after Margaret Thatcher's face as a, teen- as a teenager? B, was it taken from the death mask of a drowning victim? Or C, was it designed by a blind person? I'm going to go with B, death mask, because it's the most metal answer. You are correct. When in doubt, yes! go with metal. Uh, yes! I will post an embarrassing childhood photo on my Instagram. I've got quite a few. One of them I posted recently, which is just me. Um, I, I took a Mr. Potato Head toy into the Sears Portrait Studio with 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 us when my family went to do that. It must have been my favorite toy. I don't know why, but I am. It's sitting on the table next to me, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, mm-hmm. So that one, I, I can't put po- that one. I've posted a ton, but yeah, there was a. Uh, this is a really interesting story. A very famous death mask in the late 19th century called L'Inconnu de la Seine, and I suck at French pronunciation. It was essentially an unknown, unclaimed uh, young girl with a beautiful, calm face that was so intriguing that they made death masks of it that hung in in rooms all over Paris. And when in the in the 1950s, that was the basis for the face of CPR dummies that we even see today. Crazy, crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. And, I, and, I hope that my I just hope that my death mask is not detailed, you know, because <laughs> my face is going full Jason Robards, well, you know, just a sl- just slack. Maybe my whole face is going to go. Maybe you can put a thing in your will to like where they can do a little fa- facelift on the desk mask. Death yeah, mask that's what the, I need. Before I need the plastic somebody. cures, just sort of pull it up a little bit. I don't want plastic surgery now. I just want to be remembered <laughs> as being a little younger. It's cheaper Please. anyway. Right. Yeah, I don't <laughs> need it. I just it's listen, you're, you're going to be dead a lot longer than you were alive. Yeah, that's right. So in perpetuity, you'll be remembered uh, for for having a, a lifted face. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a crazy weird story. And I was talking to a gentleman from Scotland yesterday. Oh, there was a, the magic convention was here in town in Columbus. So wizards mm-hmm. from all over the world would come in for three days and, you know, teach each other magic tricks. And I, I was telling the story to this gentleman, Hugh, from from Scotland, and he knew about it because when he studied to be an EMT, they taught them that story while they were learning CPR. And I don't think I would want to know that, like while I was. <laughs> about to put my mouth on this dummy being told, oh yeah, and what you're putting your mouth on is fashioned after a you know 19th century dead girl. That was, right. It's somewhat morbid when you think about it that way. It is. For the next, I mean, it's better than thinking that she's real. Or I mean, like alive. That's true. I'm, I'm sure those people like, exist too that we got to talk to my talk priest about. before I can kiss this. <laughs> Okay. That's that's the way Mike Pence uh, learned EMT, learned learned CPR <laughs> on a live person. Yeah, he had to get permission from his wife before he could put <laughs> practice on the dummy. There it is. That's he, what I was thinking. He yes. asked yeah. if uh, it yeah. was a female dummy or a male dummy first. Yes, and, you know that you're not supposed to do the mouth to mouth anymore. Is that is that anyone's I, listening? This is new information yeah. to me. I think you're supposed to do like 15 pumps of the chest mm-hmm. and then just leave the mouth alone. Really? But I could be wrong. And it's mostly because, not because it doesn't work, but because people giving CPR uh, pass out. 
I believe, is the the, uh, the person administering the CPR passes out. You eventually you eventually get so tired that you can't do it anymore. And so they were like, let's just let's just stick with the pumps. That's a weird <laughs> and reason because it's, it's like this works, but but it also makes people tired. So don't do it. Yes. That's, I, that's it's a, different for drowning. And it's I just yeah. know that they updated it because I'm CPR certified. Are you really? You know, just in case. Yeah, man. I live in a city. That's, gotta you gotta get you gotta get vaccinated for everything and you gotta you gotta learn how to make a tourniquet. Yeah. You never know what's gonna happen. I feel I can make a tourniquet. I had to take um, survival you're also training. Not supposed to do, you're not supposed to do tourniquets anymore. Oh, you just learned a bunch of antiquated <laughs> knowledge. Yeah, I did. I did. I learned all this like, when I was in high school. And they were like, by the way, tourniquets could like easily, you know, cause someone to go into shock. Wow. Because if you make it wrong. Yeah. Um, so they're like, don't don't actually do that. But <laughs> anyway, I, I had to here's take, how you do it. I had to take SEER training uh, on one of my military tours when I was performing for the military like survival evasion recovery something training and i had to learn like how to do some of that stuff but but not like the yeah. real hands-on version of it just like a powerpoint <laughs> <laughs> so in theory i know how to do this that's that's very strange uh so all right let's move on for this next question we're playing for 70 internet points oh boy i don't know how many you currently have acquired but you're going to get I... 70 more if you get this question right too many for account. people who go into cardiac arrest outside of a hospital and don't receive CPR, the survival rate is around 8%. When those people receive CPR outside of the hospital, their survival rate jumps to what? Okay, so do I have to like get the exact percentage? No, I will give you a multiple choice. Oh, okay, because I was going to say, before you even say it, mm -hmm. my guess is that it does not go up very high okay okay because so, it's once you're in bad enough shape you know and you're trying yeah it's, it's gonna be hard so eight percent is when you're already in the hospital and mm -hmm. uh or excuse me eight percent is if you do not receive cpr okay this is when you're outside of the hospital right because all these numbers are different if you're in the hospital you're you're if they're giving you cpr in a hospital it's a much different case right if you're outside of the hospital and you receive the CPR, here are your three choices. A, 22% survive, B, 9% survive, or C, 75% survive. Okay. Again, I'm going to say B. Yeah, I'm going to say B. B, 9%. Yes. The answer is A, 22%. Oh. Uh, so, oh, yeah. I... I overcorrected. You you did, and and correction is needed because there was a study in the New England Journal of Medicine that that showed in movies and TV CPR uh, the person survives CPR seventy five percent of the time. They analyzed a, a whole bunch of CPR uses in in modern uh, television and film, and seventy five percent is an unrealistic number. We should set our expectations to under a third of the time. Under a I thought it was going to be a trick question where they're like. If you're in the hospital, you're just going to catch some other weird bacteria. You know, I've watched like enough, <laughs> enough uh, house that yeah. I know uh, when you go to the hospital, that's a very dangerous place. I'm not trying to, you know, if you're listening to this and you need to go to the, if you're listening to this on the way to the hospital, you should still go. But we've already established, saying. Dan, at this point in the podcast that if you if you're listening to us talk about medicine, don't do what we say, because yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I just about, to... don't do mouth to mouth. Don't do tourniquets. <laughs> Don't yeah. just just, you know, maybe you, maybe you should just modernize your your training. If you're getting if you're getting CPR right. training, go and get modernized and then we'll be good. This is not yeah, a medical just, podcast. Do not take any of this advice. <laughs> seriously. I Yeah, I just I was just thinking of the idea of like, oh, I'm going into cardiac arrest. Would it be better for someone to just. Yeah, just defibrillate me right here. Yeah. And that's or a whole should other I thing, go to the know? hospital. Now I've seen there's a James Bond where he defibrillates himself and Oof. seems yeah. like if there's a uh, that was better than going wall, to the hospital. Yeah, if there's a you defibrillator know? on the wall, that's that's probably best case if you've got a bunch of untrained yeah. people around. But uh, yeah. no, if you do nothing, you're at you're eight percent of survival. You do the CPR, twenty two percent. So great, there you go. Just you just CPR. make sure that you've studied what the most recent protocol 
is well, for Well, you're CPR. protected by a good Samaritan law, so you should just get in there, start punching stuff. Punching you know, like, stuff. Uh, where is the heart? <laughs> you start slapping the person in the face. Is this how I do it? Anything's better than I've nothing. got Narcan in my purse. Will that work? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Probably. Question three. For this question, we are playing for a coveted The Internet Says It's True sticker. They're extremely oh valuable. Very hard to come by, except I get, did give a lot to friends at, at the Magic Convention this weekend. Uh, but you, if you're not a magician, you're not a wizard, you, they're hard to come. But you have to win a, a you either have to join Patreon, in which case you get one, or you have to be on the show and win the third question. Which one of these is a nickname for CPR? Here are your choices. A, the tongue of life. B, the kiss of life. Or C, the jaws of life. <laughs> I'm going to say the kiss of life. You would be correct. The kiss yes. of life. Tongue's which, too dirty. Jaws of life or is when you, you know, you get stuck in a car, car. and yeah. you're stuck in there. It, that's what I'm going to need when I uh, when I live out my fate as a 12 pound baby and become a 400 pound adult or whatever. So you see yourself on a journey to return to the, oh, the I, same proportions as you were born. I see myself as levying the waters the inevitable flood that's coming for us all except instead of it being external it is completely internal if and i if will the, one day need cpr and you know if a the doctor's help to help me lose weight again if the pandemic didn't break that levy then i think you're well, gonna it be broken i just yeah you're seeing me now that i'm back in the world <laughs> and i'm also seeing you from the shoulders up right now so <laughs> I uh, I did gain 25 pandemic pounds um, right away, right? Like the, we're talking first month and I haven't been able to lose. I haven't tried to lose it either, but right, I haven't right, been right. able to, to really be motivated. You know, I to found lose it. I found that I was really thriving when the weather was nice, was mm. running, eating right. And it's because I wasn't seeing my friends who <laughs> force feed me and, you know, buy me beers. Yeah. So I was finally like, wow. Maybe I'm not sad. Maybe it's other people that are the problem. And now I'm back. <laughs> now I'm I, just back. I do better when, you know, I've been on the road more uh, now that things are starting to open up a little bit. And I do better on the road because I can't just sit and eat snack food and sit in front of the TV all the time. I'm always moving. Yeah, you're moving to the poutine that's available at the. I don't I don't <laughs> seek out. I do Occasionally, if I'm extremely tired, I'll make bad choices and seek out comfort food, which when I'm on the road generally is um, Buffalo Wild Wings. Because there, oh, yeah. there's a lot of consistency, and, and that's what I always really like is consistency uh, when I'm on the sure. road. I, I want to know that I'm going to get a good meal. I don't have time to worry about getting a bad meal and then having to eat right. again. And they, have a, and they have a trivia game, so you can just sit there. Which is nice. I'm pretty good a... at the trivia. Yeah. That's how I find my next week's topics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. So you're going to get stolen all of these from Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> yes. Buffalo Wild Wings, where you learn about uh, dead girls in the River Seine when, uh, when you're eating your wings. No, this is uh, not where that came from. Question four. For this question, we are playing for an embarrassing story. So if you get it right, I'll tell you an embarrassing story. If you get it wrong, you have to tell me one. I don't on know the you, podcast? Yeah, like just a quick, you know, just a couple minute embarrassing story. You don't have to do material. I'm not paying you to do material. So you don't have to do something from, you know. I don't know why I'm, I don't know why I'm setting myself up like I'm going to get this wrong. Well, this one, it, uh, you, I think this one you'll get. I think this one you'll get. Okay. You had talked about how they, they no longer tell you to do mouth to mouth, but they do still want you to do chest compressions. Which one of these songs is famously used to demonstrate the correct rate of chest compressions? There are three three choices a, but i'll tell you i'll tell you before you even give me the let's do, let's do it let's do it it's uh the bg's staying alive you are correct it is the bg staying alive i want you to know what my other choices were going to be uh the yes, devil please i'm sorry i didn't mean to ruin the it. devil went down to georgia or 50 ways <laughs> to leave your lover were the other two choices <laughs> and you're counting the pumps yeah you're, you're like one step get out the back jack yeah <laughs> make, make a new, new plan, plan stan, stan. <laughs> but it's not to the rhythm you're just counting you're like i gotta remember all these <laughs> yeah, so i make sure that i get to the 50th pump that's not gonna save anyone but it is a way to leave your lover <laughs> i guess i didn't mean to ruin it because those are funny answers no uh, i just i, always I just am know impressed. i am impressed when when i don't have to read the multiple choice that's that's fantastic <laughs> devil went down to georgia is a fantastic you know 
It might even be close to the Bee Gees. I think it's too fast, probably. Probably too fast. Oh, yeah, that is true. I, and well, that's double. You're going to revive the person twice as twice fast. as fast. Yeah. And then that's they're going to be superhuman. They're going to have the, like a 200 BPM heart rate. Well, they'll have met the devil and they'll come back and tell you the story. <laughs> but like only, I just beat the devil in a yeah. violin contest. Yeah, fiddle so, contest. I, and I know the, the staying alive was almost memed because there was a very famous scene from The Office about staying alive. Oh. Uh, you know, they're, they're doing a CPR class and, and failing uh, miserably at the CPR and then Dwight ends up cutting the face off the CPR dummy and and doing like a Silence of the Lambs, Lambs type thing with it. Well, yeah. I just want to say that I went to um, a party with a bunch of doctors and they were explaining how they had to practice on cadavers oh, and no. how it was the weirdest. The first thing you do with the cadaver is you try, you do the chest compressions. They like teach you how to do it on a real body. You don't get a fake. Uh, I didn't know that. Child. So you, you work on the cadaver and the first thing they teach you is staying alive. So now, so now staying alive is ruined for them because, you know, there's all these doctors in a room seeing a cadaver up close for the first yeah. time. Horrible and now they can never listen to the Bee Gees. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I just think that's a great, great thing. And I hope the Bee Gees are proud that they've saved lives. When I hear some of the music that's in my magic show when I'm like driving or if, if I'm in someone else's car and a song comes on, cause like if it's in my car and a song comes on, that's in my show, I will change it. But if it's mm -hmm. in, you know, a store or somewhere where I can't change it, I get anxiety because I'm like, I feel like I have to be doing something. I feel like I'm, I'm, you know, my heart will skip because I feel like I'm supposed to be, oh, yeah. I'm about to go on. There's a, there's a association. Imagine if that feeling instead of, Oh, I got to go do a magic show. It was, I'm thinking of dead bodies right now. That how bad yeah. that's horrible. That's, well, they that's get used dramatic. to it. Oh. The, the the sad thing about doctors is that we're all born with the same level of disgust, but doctors get so used to seeing everything mm -hmm. that they just, they don't, you know, they're not going to faint at the sight of blood anymore. And they're not going to faint when they see a dead body. And uh, so really what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, doctors are psychopaths. <laughs> you know, we got to watch out for them. We're training them. And they, they're thinking about dead bodies, no matter what songs on. There are some more songs. Uh, the New York Presbyterian hospital compiled a list of other songs that can be used. And these are some things nice. from the list. The list includes Hanson's Mbop, nice. Abba's Dancing Queen, and Missy Elliott's Work It. <laughs> <laughs> Those are all songs that you can also revive a person to. You flip it and reverse it. Yeah. You, you, once you screw you, it up and you turn the person on their back. I mean, yeah. you turn the person on their stomach. And yeah. Your, yeah. I just want to go back and tell you that exactly what you're describing with the music, you know, making your heart rate go up or something. Um, is why you should never, ever make a specific ringtone for either your significant other or a, f a close friend or your boss. You will lose that job or you will get out of that relationship and then you'll hear Flight of the Bumblebee and you will <laughs> feel insane for two minutes. Yes. So just don't ever do that. I All did right. it with an ex and then it was a bad time every time i heard it oh yeah yeah i it's, the sense memory is is very strong i have to tell you an embarrassing story and i've got a quick one i was at a conference where we get go to get booked by colleges and there's a gentleman on stage a comedian who did a 5 minute showcase which is called a sampler as you know and he was very funny but the audience didn't really understand him cuz he's a weird guy and wearing a hat long hair beard i leave the theater after his set and maybe like 20 minutes later i see him walking down the hallway and i was like hey really good set that was awesome and he goes oh thank you man appreciate it and i said i feel like they didn't uh they didn't get you as much as they should have which i shouldn't have said i mean that's a rude thing to say but like i was trying to bond with the man you know i'm like like i feel like five minutes is tough and they they really like don't have time to really get get it you know and he was like no i thought it went pretty well it was, it was pretty good uh and then I turn around, he, leave, he leaves and goes through the door, and I turn around, and then I see the comedian coming down the hallway. I was talking to a completely different person <laughs> who went along with the whole thing, knew that I was, I mean, I had made references to comedy, I think. I said, you know, really great jokes and stuff. No, this man was a guitar player for a band that just happened to be wearing a very similar <laughs> outfit and went along with it as to, I guess, either have fun with me or not embarrass me or whatever. And once yeah. I saw the other guy, I, I didn't approach him, but I did go no, back yeah, to the guitar yeah, you got player. A second, 
they yeah. gave you a second chance i went to back to the guitar yeah, i did yeah and i didn't i didn't but i i didn't redeem myself when i when i went back and i saw the guy who i was talking to the guitar player i just walked up to him with a slow clap and he was laughing he was like i felt so bad but i didn't want to say anything so it was an embarrassing <laughs> moment but it it was it happened i love that i wish you had gone up to the real comedian and been like you know what you suck. I just remind. I just. I, I, I missed my shot before. Yeah, yeah. Your band sucks. Your band sucks. You don't even play music. You just tell jokes. That's not music. It's not music. Uh, just and confuse everybody. I actually everybody did it again last night. I confused one magician for another magician because they have similar hair, and I saw him from the back. I'm just. I, I need to just stop talking to strangers. You're face blind. I guess so. <laughs> it was the back of his head. And the other guy was wearing like a fancy uh, hat was, and a denim jacket. It was jacket. the front of his head. It, it was, was the front of his head, but it was a beard. And you're like, what is this front hair? Last time it's I saw mind. you, you had that on the back of your head. It's weird that you've moved it. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. I love uh, it. It would be it would be pretty great to write a write either a like a a sitcom or maybe a screenplay about a face blind person who that gets them yeah. into trouble. I feel like that maybe the joke wears out somewhat quickly, though. Yeah, I think they did. I mean, it must have been Thirty Rock probably did like a whole season where someone's face blind. That that would make sense. That seems like an affliction that would be that would be on the show. So, question number five is for all the marbles, Dan. If you get this wrong, I'm banning you from the show, never to be asked (laughs) on again, ever. Uh, You were on Joke Story Trick. You this is your second appearance on this podcast, but uh, this is it if you don't get this one right. Uh, and this yeah. is a question. This is actually, I think, the third or maybe fourth week I've asked this question in a row to the to the guest. And I like the answers, so we're going to stick with it for a while. Here it is. Okay. What piece of advice would you give to 17-year-old Dan Wilbur? All right. There's a lot going through my head. But mainly, I would tell him to calm down. <laughs> that, that not everything is... Um, you know, just you should just be less of a spaz. I don't want to be negative, but uh, not every interaction is going to be remembered for all time. And uh, I, I'm not saying that all 17 year olds are narcissists, but I was. <laughs> so a part of that was feeling really bad that, oh, I said the wrong thing and I did the wrong thing and, and a lot of social anxiety, which I stifled with. Uh, substances, which is also which just makes it worse. And then, so that's what I would say. I was like, you don't need uh, booze. What you need is to calm down and relax because everybody's just, you know, everyone's just trying to have a good time here. You sure. could just you could just relax and be a person. Uh, but instead, from about seventeen until thirty, uh, <laughs> I I felt on stage. Yeah. And uh, probably a product of being on stage, you know. And now lot. that you're now that you're, you know, once once you hit 30, it's much easier to let go of those interactions that you have in those memories until the devil went down to Georgia comes on the radio. Yes. And then you're yes. right. And back then it comes back into oh, the and fly to the bumblebee. And, yeah. Fly to yes. the bumblebee. Yeah. Well, you know, what's funny is I was talking to my friend Zach about covid specifically. And if you don't want to talk about that feel free to cut this um <laughs> that that what's funny about uh the past couple years is that you finally got to this place where you were comfortable and you're like well not everyone's going to remember every single interaction i should just relax and then quarantine happened and you only saw like one or two people a week and so you'd have like a weird interaction with someone and then it just stayed with you and you're like <laughs> i guess i I guess I just have to live with I said that weird thing and you're not used to socializing. So you just you just like think about it. Like I there's a woman walking her dog in my neighborhood and I didn't see her for two weeks after I said, you know, something stupid. And then two weeks later, I was like, hey, I said that stupid thing. I'm sorry. And she was like, yeah, I was thinking about it for the last two weeks. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm sorry. It's like the difference between Twitter and Facebook. You can write something stupid on Twitter and nobody knows tomorrow, but on Facebook you yeah. have to keep getting notifications for the next week yeah. when more people yes. see it and keep commenting on it. And somehow Facebook is also in that realm of I remember something snide you said in the comments section 7 years ago and yeah. so I'm still upset about it yeah. versus Twitter where someone could, 
you know, just call you a nasty name and you'd be like, ah, I'm going to g- continue with my life. <laughs> I don't care. Oh, Dan, uh, I will count all of that as a correct answer. Um, so you are allowed back on the show. Um, we've gotten so far off from the show topic, which is fine. I, that's why I bring people on to have fun and to, to you know, we can end on a lighthearted mood and not talking about a dead girl from hundreds of years ago. Wow, we got uh, to mental health. We did get a little bit into, into health. mental health. We got into the pandemic. We got into uh, songs and songwriting. We got into memory. We got into sense memory. And it's been a pleasure. Uh, Dan, they can find you at danwilber.com. And that's Wilbur, W-I-L-B-U-R. Uh, you're mm-hmm. at Dan Wilbur on Twitter, at Dan Wilbur Comedy on Instagram. Um, what are you working on? What? Where can we see you? I, uh, I'm back in the city. I'm doing stand up. I got some shows coming up. Those are on my website. So if you're in New York, you can come see me. I'm working on more writing projects and websites. So, you know, just, just keep, keep checking back Fantastic. Follow me on Instagram. I'll post all about it. He's in, and TikTok as well. You've got some great videos on oh, TikTok. Yeah. So, so find him there. Thank you so much for joining us again, Dan. This was a pleasure. Thank you. Well, that's all for this week. Thanks to Drew for the show topic and to Dan Wilbur for being my guest. I asked a young Norwegian toy maker to say the following. Thank you for listening to The Internet Says It's True. Don't forget to join up on Patreon if you want to see the unedited video of the guest appearance or to hear bonus episodes. You can do that at patreon.com slash Michael Kent. Also, if you learned something that you didn't already know from the show, please visit iTunes and leave us a review with five stars and a few words. That's the rule. You gotta do it. That helps us a ton because that's how the algorithm works to get the podcast suggested to more people. And that way we can keep learning something new. If the internet says it's true. The Internet Says It's True would like to thank the Patreon subscribers whose monthly contributions help make this show possible. Sean Brown, Catherine Morgan, Taylor Hurt, Tony Ford, Bryce Swanson, Eugene Anderson, Matt McVeigh, Jim Martin, Joanne Martin, and the show's official Emperor Kick Track. The show is written and produced by me, Michael Kent. The theme song is by Finite Music Forge, and additional music this week was from Kevin McLeod under Creative Commons license and Asher Falero. All audio clips in this episode are used for education and commentary and used under Fair Use Title 17 USC Section 107. You can listen to past episodes by searching for The Internet Says It's True wherever you get your podcasts, and you can see bonus content at Patreon. Patreon.com slash Michael Kent.